You're watching WHPS, Highland Park, Detroit. FM 88.1 WHPR, Highland Park. WVIE 107.3 FM Charlotte, Amalia, Virgin Islands. The views and opinions expressed on the following show are not necessarily the views and opinions of WAS, its affiliates, management, or sponsors. If you're tuned in to 88.1 FM WHPR in the Highland Park, Detroit area, welcome. And to those that are in the Virgin Islands on 107.3 WVIE, how you doing? And send us some sunshine this way. Everyone that's on Facebook or RadioWeCanSee.com, welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, sometimes there are some shows that are near and dear to my heart. This is one of them. We have a monument that you've probably driven by many times if you're going eastbound on Jefferson in the city of Detroit. It's just a few feet or miles, not even a whole mile really, from the Belle Isle Bridge. It is known as the Broadhead Armory. There's a lot of rich history, architecturally, American history, and black history contained in the walls of that building that is just sitting there. And many of you who've driven past there probably wondered what it was, why is it just sitting there, and does it have a purpose? Well, guess what? We're gonna answer all those questions for you tonight. I want to honor and welcome to the show two military veterans. First, I will welcome Mr. Robert Middleton. Would you please greet our guest, Mr. Middleton, Middleton and tell them a little bit about your rank and your service and what you've done in the military. All right. Um, uh, my name is Robert Middleton. and. Um, I uh, work on behalf of the Broadhead Association. Um, I was in the United States Marine Corps uh, from 1967 uh, to 1970, did two years in the reserves. Um, I uh, made the rank of sergeant uh, when I got out for a total period of uh, five years. Served in the Republic of uh, Vietnam uh, from 68 to 69. And um, I was uh, very fortunate to, uh, to come back home in one Peace. Uh, I am really uh, glad that uh, I got this opportunity You provide us with a, uh, a forum to discuss something that is very close to our hearts in terms of uh, developing the, and renovating the Broadhead Armor. So uh, I congratulate your audience and hopefully we can share something of significant historical uh, significance. Yes. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Commander Semerad, could you enlighten our viewers and our listeners to your military service and what you have done and what brings you here today? Thank you, Valerie. And I think Robert is uh, maybe underselling himself a little bit. He was, uh, for those who don't know, he was on the border of South Vietnam and North Vietnam and being bombed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, he's lived to uh, survive that. And also he's of the iconic Montfort Point Marines, which um, just an incredible honor. I, I joined the Navy at 18 and went up to Great Lakes uh, for my boot camp and went to Mayport for a destroyer couple tours over to Med. I'm proud of it that I went to 18 countries and 28 different cities in about two and a half years. But I left to uh, get a degree and got my college degree and my graduate degree and been working in uh, information technology business until about 2008 when it was convenient to go back on active duty. Um, I did get my commission. I went over to the Pentagon, went over to Italy, went over to AFRICOM, worked a lot in Ghana and Cameroon and Sierra uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And then I came back and worked at the VA Medical Center. But it, it's, once you join the Navy or the Marine Corps, you feel like it's a lifelong thing. Like they say in the Marines, I'm not a ex Marine. I'm a former Marine until the day I, um, God takes me to his, uh, other world. So thank you for allowing me that opportunity to talk about my, uh, little bit about my Navy career. I appreciate that. And I want to thank you for your service. My father, was a Vietnam veteran. My husband was a Vietnam veteran. And my uncle is a Vietnam veteran. I honor the service that you and Mr. Milliton did for this country. But what I honor even more is you're still serving. And that brings us to the point of this show. So let's talk about the Broadhead Preservation Association by beginning with this video. So we're going to show a video that tells us what happened from the beginning of Broadhead until now. So stay tuned. I'm Master Chief Mark Hakala. I spent 30 years in the Navy, but I've spent my whole life being intrigued by naval customs, traditions, history, heritage, and uniforms. So I'd like to share some of that enthusiasm with you using some items in my personal collection to get us started. Let's see what's in the sea chest today. On the east side of Detroit is a building with an absolutely incredible history, the Detroit Naval Armory also known as the R. Thornton Broadhead Armory. In addition to training Navy and Marine Corps reservists, this building with its huge drill deck was host to public events and sporting events. It would accumulate the most extensive collection of Depression-era art of any building in the state of Michigan. I have quite a few things that deal with the history of this building. October 6, 1930, the Detroit Naval Armory is opened with huge fanfare and festivities. The building had been designed by William Buck Stratton, a noted architect in the area and also a crew member of USS Yosemite. On the facade of the building are five Puwabic pottery tiles. This is an art pottery still in existence just up the street. 
known for its iridescent glazes. Its founder, Mary Chase Perry Stratton, was married to the architect. By the time the building opened, the country was in the midst of a depression. And the state of Michigan didn't earmark all that much money for the upkeep of the building. So Commander Broadhead had to get creative. The drill deck was absolutely gargantuan, so it would be easy to set up bleachers and have public events. On his first run for the White House, Franklin Delano Roosevelt campaigned on that drill deck. But the most common event was boxing matches. In fact, in the fall of 1932, a young fighter, Joseph Barrow, decided he was ready for his first bout. Now, he'd been training in secret, so just to make sure his mother didn't find out what he'd been doing, he dropped his last name and just went with his first and his middle name, Joe Lewis. That first fight against Johnny Myler, who had been on the U.S. Olympic boxing team, was an amateur bout scheduled for three rounds. In two rounds, Joe Lewis was knocked down seven times, and they called the fight. He obviously learned from it because he went on to become the greatest heavyweight fighter of all time and one of the greatest African-American athletes in history. He went on to serve in the Army in World War II and is buried now in Arlington National Cemetery. In addition to the rental aid come, Commander Broadhead had been tapping into funds available through the Works Progress Administration one of Roosevelt's initiatives to keep people employed. He'd been using the money for janitorial support, but then he found out that there was a subset program within the WPA, the Federal Art Projects. This was designed to pay artists to put their works inside public buildings. Commander Broadhead had an addition put on up top, the wardroom or the officer's dining area, and it had a long wall with bookcases and a fireplace. He thought murals would be perfect, so he chose a young and promising artist by the name of David Friedenthal. In his young career, Friedenthal had gotten two Guggenheim fellowships, and his works can now be found in 47 museums and other public collections. Friedenthal's figures are very classic to the Depression era. Figures, even at rest, are shown straining, torquing, twisting. It's ironic that when so many people were out of work, the subject of many of these murals was work. Friedenthal did his murals al fresco. He did it right onto wet plaster. In addition to the five panels he did surrounding the fireplace, he also did a smaller work in the bar area. In the adjacent mess hall, Broadhead wanted to get some additional murals. His officers weren't too keen on Friedenthal's style, though, and they wanted paintings of ships. When Broadhead approached Friedenthal with this, Friedenthal said, painting ships, that's billboard work, it's beneath me. So Broadhead got an additional artist, Edgar Yeager, who was an accomplished painter. And Broadhead gave photographs of the ships that had either been at Detroit or with one of the Great Lakes naval militias. Yeager's challenge was, in essentially a rectangular room, to paint these ships on the walls and not make it look like it was billboard work. And what he did was ingenious. From each corner, Yeager put details to give you the illusion that you were standing on the deck of your own ship looking off to Porter Starboard at these other ships anchored around you. He even included two funnels with mirrors in them to give a little bit more depth to the room. The effect was absolutely fantastic, and his work was hailed by newspaper art critics. In 1975, Jaeger was brought back to touch up his work and Friedenthal's, and he got the opportunity to do something he hadn't done before, sign his work. Each of these painters had crews of assistants working with them. One of them, John Tabachuk, a Polish immigrant who was also a woodcarver, was asked to do inset wood carvings on the various doors around the building. He ended up doing about 20 of these, but then Broadhead had another idea. Why not have the banister leading from the first deck up to the third deck wardroom carved? This turned into a whole new project for Tabachuk. 
this incredibly beautiful, intricate woodwork portraying sea creatures real and imagined was just absolutely gorgeous. One of Edgar Yeager's assistants, Gustav Hildebrand, would get his own project. A key player in the murals had been a Belgian plasterer whose name is lost to history. He was able to lay plaster up perfectly, no holes, and this enabled Hildebrand to carry out his idea, which was to do line drawings of sailors engaged in various maritime activities. You see sailors on guard duty, working the capstan, holy stoning the deck, and even on one side there is a small drawing of a cat because Tom, the armory's cat, used to come and mooch lunch off of Gustav Hildebrand every day. In 1938, one of the officers came up with a great idea. At the back wall of the drill deck, opposite the front door, they created the entire starboard side of a ship. On this, they included every kind of fitting that would help to train sailors. There were deck fittings, there were deck guns, there was a bridge with a helm, engine order telegraph, a signal bridge. It was incredibly innovative. In 1940, America could see war on the horizon. In order to get ready, every reserve and National Guard element was recalled to active duty. This would provide a new opportunity for the armory. Into the huge drill deck were brought bunk beds and lockers, and this was now turned into a bedroom for 500 sailors who were here as one of two schools, the electrician's made school and the diesel school. The school continued to operate all the way to the end of the war. In 1943, a veteran of many decades of service, Captain Broadhead, retired. He would stay a member of the Armory Board of Control until 1947 when he passed away. In honor of his decades of faithful service, the state of Michigan officially renamed the building the R. Thornton Broadhead Armory. Nineteen forty eight was the fiftieth anniversary of the Spanish American War, and the surviving veterans of USS Yosemite donated a huge bronze plaque listing the name of the entire crew, and it was surmounted by a wooden carving of the ship. Absolutely gorgeous. Additionally, outside the building, a bas relief sculpture was put up to honor the service of Edwin Denby. Inside, the building returned to its status as a training facility for reserve personnel. To accommodate many more reservists than before the war, a balcony was put surrounding the drill deck and offices and classrooms were put on both levels. In addition to classroom instruction, there were also various and sundry training aids. After World War II, training ships would return to Broadhead. Depending on the year, there was typically a surface ship and a submarine and a dock was built behind the armory for them to tie up. The first submarine was USS Ciro, followed by USS Tambor, and then finally USS Piper. Piper, on its third war patrol, was commanded by Edward L. Beach, author of the famed book and movie Run Silent, Run Deep. The last surface ship was USS Amherst, PCER 853. That's a patrol craft escort and rescue, Basically, it was a minesweeper, but they modified the spaces to include more rooms for patients. As we moved closer to the Japanese home islands during World War II, hospital ships just weren't enough to handle all the casualties we were incurring. So these became large sort of ambulances. In 1980, Broadhead was coming up on its 50th anniversary, and plans were made to commemorate that. Pawabic Pottery, just up the street, was commissioned to create some commemorative tiles. A fun run was held. A set of postal first aid covers was issued, depicting the armory and numerous Detroit ships. Commemorative souvenirs were sold, and a grand ball for 500 people commemorating both the Navy's birthday and Broadhead's birthday was held. Just a few years later, in 1987, 
the Navy decided to consolidate the resources of the several reserve centers in the area, and one in another city was chosen over Broadhead, and the Navy left the armory. This left the Marines, Headquarters and Service Company, 1st Battalion, 24th Marines, and the local Sea Cadet Division, James M. Hannon Division, which was the first one in the country, as the only tenants of Broadhead Armory. In 2005, the Marines, too, left, and the building has been empty ever since. In the intervening years, the armory has been devastated. The beautiful wood carvings on the banisters, on the doors, every one of them stolen. The, the wardroom murals have been damaged by water and unstable temperature changes. Jaeger's mess deck murals have likewise been damaged, and they even went into the wall and stole the metal from the funnel to sell as scrap. Not only that, thieves have taken all the handrails from around the building as well as all the copper pipe. They even stole some structural support material for scrap and part of the roof collapsed. The Yosemite crew plaque, stolen. And most amazingly, outside, right in view of a major street, thieves stole the bronze sculpture of Edwin Denby to sell for scrap. Temperature change and water have also damaged Gustav Hildebrand's line drawings. The future of Broadhead is now coming down to the wire. The city of Detroit is looking at two possibilities. One, to give it to the Broadhead Armory Preservation Society, which would restore it, establish a home for sea cadet units, veterans organizations, educational organizations. And the other, sell it to a company that will destroy the entire back half of the building, all the offices, and turn the site of Joe Lewis's first career fight into a parking lot for parade floats. As I wrote the nomination for this building for the National Register of Historic Places in 1993, I can only hope that they make the right decision. Check back soon for more content. Thanks for watching. You are listening to 88.1 FM WHPR, the real black coffee, no sugar, no cream. And we just heard the history of the Broadhead Academy on Jefferson in the city of Detroit. Sergeant Middleton, when you were watching that, what was going through your mind? <laughs> well, of course, the fact that the building had really gone into uh, tremendous disrepair over the years um, and how great a loss it was to have historical artifacts and, you know, uh, wood carvings and all types of or, or, ornate structures um, uh, removed. However, we have, were able to preserve uh, many of them in storage, but some of them were stolen. But um, uh, it, it makes my heart heavy because it's one of the few standing memorials to the service of our veterans, especially World War II. Uh, it really uh, is uh, di distinctive to the landscape of the city of Detroit mm -hmm. and um, embodies uh, Detroit's world-renowned reputation as the arsenal of democracy and the city that was responsible for winning the war. So in 2018, uh, myself and Jim Sumrad and a, a group of others uh, got together to do due diligence on the property to uh, consider renovating uh, and restoring the property to its uh, former glory. So our hearts have been heavy over the years and we wanted to basically turn the property around and make it a uh, and restore it to its former glory and make it a world class uh, attraction. Thank you. Thank you for that. Commander, as you were watching and listening to that, what was going through your mind? Well, I'm going to handle it in two parts. Um, first is Mark Hackler was an enlisted 
sailor, and he served at Broadhead. And he advanced through the ranks, and he's now at the highest level of enlisted uh, ranks in the military. He left, he was uh, in Detroit, and he left, and he now he left for Washington, D.C., and now serves as the director of the Presidential Honor Guard. So um, he is hoping one day to come back after he finishes that tour of duty. But in the Marines, uh, they don't have any medical, and he was medical. Um, they gave people their health checkups, and so he worked at Broadhead to uh, support the Marines. But in my opinion, uh, having seen Broadhead uh, before and after, and having traveled heavily around the world, and having grown up in Baltimore, New Orleans, uh, many other cities, I've seen, and even in Detroit, you see buildings that were in much worse shape than Broadhead Army. Uh, the Fox Theater, Orchestra Hall, and all of these cities like New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, they've been able to bring these buildings back to life. And they've become huge incubators for the prosperity of those cities. And to me, uh, we are bringing out the eraser and we're erasing a big part of Michigan or Detroit's architectural genius, artistic genius, and black history by, um, by if we go to the alternative plan of, and I, I hate to mention it, but it, it's the parade company. And I see a win-win. You haven't lived in New Orleans where they, you know, I was there when they invented the idea, of, why not do Mardi Gras year round? We'll make all the floats into a, a year round display. And they did that. They found an old abandoned warehouse and they, uh, put the floats there. It's not convenient if you're a visitor, but it does attract quite a few people, which points out that um, the parade company could locate in many other locations versus tearing down, number one, the largest collection of WPA artwork in the state of Michigan. Braden Hall actually worked with Diego Rivera. And, and while Diego Rivera was painting those murals in the Detroit Institute of Arts, but he came from Cranbrook Academy. Um, William Buck Stratton, who was the architect of the building, designed it uh, with many very feature, many features that are studied by modern day architects. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he's right up there with Albert Kahn. Wow. I mean, he's so iconic. And so, um, and he, he married Mary Chase Stratton, or Mary Ch Chase Berry, who founded Puebic Pottery. I mean, his wife used to work in, the, uh, in that building making pottery. And many, many of those pieces are in Broadhead Armor. So I, I just, uh, it, it just boggles my mind that uh, Detroit would try to erase a big part of the architectural footprint of Detroit and black history. It's a huge monument to black history. And uh, I, I, don't, I just don't understand it. I don't but, uh, either. I think we would all be rewarded by seeing this landmark coming uh, back to life. And hopefully we'll have a little opportunity to talk about what that vision looks like. I tell you what, it, it would, truly will be a remarkable source of energy for not just the local community, but people that want to come and visit Detroit. It's going to be a destination for people uh, that want to see Detroit. They'll, they'll come from all over the world just to see Broadhead Army. Yes, they will. And I agree. And yes, we will have the opportunity to discuss what the plans are from the Broadhead Association to renovate that building and make it multi-purpose. Before we get into that, 
I want to play the clip of reasons why the armory should be saved. Can you roll that for me, Marquise? Reasons to save Broadhead. It is an iconic monument that represents the proud heritage of the armed forces whose roots date back to the Michigan Naval Militia in 1893. Broadhead Armory is a distinctive feature of the Detroit city scape that embodies our reputation as the arsenal of democracy and the city responsible for winning World War II. Broadhead Armory serves as a resource of deep personal pride in the veterans community as a symbol of bravery and sacrifice that Detroit and America is great in the eyes of the world. During World War II, the armory was used as a barracks and training center where troops learned their trades to support the war effort. Two of the Pentagon's Secretary of Defense served at the Broadhead Armory prior to being promoted to that position. Broadhead is also a black historic site where boxer Joe Lewis fought his first amateur bout. Broadhead is a veteran memorial monument erected in memory of its first naval leader, Captain Richard Thornton. Mr. Broadhead, who convinced the Michigan State Legislature to construct the building in 1930. His son, William Broadhead, an investment banker from California, wants to see the structure preserved in the name of his father. The Broadhead Association's renovation and adjacent new construction development plan provides the highest and best use of the property and will bring new life and excitement that accommodates Mayor Duggan's plans for economic development in the East Jefferson Corridor as well as the city at large. The veteran community deserves the right of diversity, inclusion, and opportunity in the Detroit City Master Plan and be permitted to develop the Broadhead property. It's wonderful. So great job. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. Tell me a little bit about your efforts with talking to city council and some of the city officials um, to convince them to preserve this. Because to me, it should be a no brainer. Um, there are so many properties coming down Woodward from the inception of the parade route until you get to the foot of Jefferson at the Detroit River. Why do they need that space? I don't know. But tell the viewers and our listeners what you and Commander and the Broadhead Preservation Association have done to date to try to convince the city leaders that your plan is the best plan. Most certainly. We have worked with the Detroit City Council uh, in efforts to uh, present our plan uh, to all the members of the Detroit City Council. We've met with the, uh, the CDC uh, and the HDC, Historic District Commission. Uh, we've met with the Detroit City team. However, we have been met with some resistance because they have had a uh, another developer in mind, but uh, unfortunately, um, you know, their plan involves demolition, and we just cannot stand by for any of this relic uh, in our landscape to be demolished at all. So um, uh, these are some of the things that uh, that we have done. Uh, we don't want our uh, Broadhead Armory to be removed from the National Historic Register. Um, uh, there are some guidelines that um, uh, that we have gone over uh, at both the state and the federal level um, to make sure that uh, we are uh, that the city is, is in compliance with that. And uh, 
fact, uh, some of those have been skirted uh, to give the upper hand uh, to another entity, but uh, we believe we have the best plan for the highest and the best use of the property. I agree. Can I interject a little Commander, bit, Robert? Yes, please chime in and, and so, give me your thoughts. So the thing is, kind of boggles my mind. I, I knew Commander Isaac in, when he was uh, running the Navy Reserve Center, and Broadhead was uh, going to be move into a, a city-operated property. And he wrote a proposal to how they would maintain and safeguard all of the um, the artifacts and, and the glory of Broadhead. So the city technically has had uh, custody of the building since 2014. And we can see the evidence under their custodianship. They allowed the building to deteriorate, which was not necessary. So the, the point that's a little confusing to me is they issue three RFPs and they get responses from developers and they reject those responses because of the effect on the historical designation. Well, the proposal that they're strongly considering right now would involve demolition of 70,000 square feet of the 106,000 square feet, removing the historical designation in order to do that and um, that portion represents almost 90% of the historical designation. So for whatever reason, I don't understand, they're now not, they're going to violate the historical designation at the city, the state, and the federal level, even to a greater extent, much greater extent, than any one of those other RFPs responses would have been. So that's a little bit confusing to me. How can you just, you know, refuse restoration efforts previously and now all of a sudden it's okay? Mm -hmm. okay. Exactly. Um, and what, what they don't understand, and I, I get it, there could be a lot of people with a lot of whimsical thinking that they can bring a building such as that back to life. The reality is, and I'm convinced, I, I'm one of those people that I'm not 110%. It's either 100% or something less, right? I, I'm a 100%er guy. But I am 100% confident. We have the money, we have the resources, we have a phenomenal plan to extend that river wall from Broadhead Armory all the way down to historic Fort Wayne and make a very uh, logical connection uh, between the two. Of course, uh, we can do Broadhead sooner. Secondly, there is no place to get a cup of coffee or an ice cream or a custard or something like that. We will have all of that. So you could casually walk into Broadhead Armory get yourself an ice cream, a coffee, a sandwich, on your way over to Belle Isle. So, and there's not anything right in that area right now that's convenient within walking distance. Mm -hmm. So you'd literally be able to walk over there and do that. With the proposed plan, you would not have any of that. It would be a sterile environment that you would be permitted to go in when you had permission. Unlike what we're proposing, the doors are open. If they're open, come in, take a look around, learn something. And hopefully we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about that. Yes, later. you know, and this is a great time to segue into that because I looked at the plan that you gave me and when I think about the Detroit 2020 plan, which, of course, we're beyond that now, and I think about uh, the developments of that East Jefferson corridor, and I think about some of the other things that may not have been mentioned um, in the plan, 
that would be good for that neighborhood and the children in it. Your plan covers it all. Affordable housing. So you have affordable, you're going to maintain the historical ha aspects. Then you're going to have affordable housing. And then you're going to have green space. And as you mentioned, coffee shops, places where if people wanted to um, have an educational event or rent the facility to you, wedding reception or, you know, common use space for the community to come in and so much more. So walk us through that plan because I just don't understand it. And maybe you can help me and my viewers understand what's going on because I don't, I don't understand what's going on. I feel like your plan is the best plan. I just, for the life of me, don't understand how housing floats in a building such as this is the best plan for that East Jefferson corridor, which has been diminished of a lot of things. So walk well, us I through the plan that you have developed. Well, I can tell you one thing. Um, uh, Valerie, is that our opponent um, with the opposing um, proposal uh, would literally run into a, a, a problem because that is not, basically, it does not provide uh, income. It's not an income generating entity to house parade books. Our plan is a revenue generating machine. And that's what makes our plan a little different and a lot more viable. And Jim, I'll let you take it from there. So uh, if I can take a couple minutes. So just a, a short outline for you, Valerie, and all of those in our listening world. Um, you know, thank you for listening in. Uh, the first floor, as you, you walk in, it, it's a large uh, venue, uh, but it's ideal for the Marine Corps ball or weddings or um, the Navy ball or many other events similar to uh, the Joe Lewis boxing match. I, I doubt that we'll have a Joe Lewis type boxing match there, but we can have a lot of different venues there. And we'll have different veterans uh, support offices on the first floor. And, and that's subject to change, depending on what the demand is for the community. There's an, an area earmarked for uh, quick dining. So you could grab a sandwich or a soda pop or a coffee or whatever. On a lower level is a daycare center, 10,000 square foot daycare center. So. You, you may decide you want to leave your kids there at the daycare center and go over to Belle Isle or go, you know, ride your bike on the river wall. Um, you can leave your kids there, you know, uh, at the daycare center. The second floor is, um, there's actually 19 offices and those offices are, the intention is to uh, build out the uh, small business administration uh, incubator. There's billions of dollars that the federal government has available to small businesses and skilled trades. And so we would be providing the education and training as to how to apply for all those contracts. And those offices, we we're originally looking at it being an overflow from Tech Town to that second floor, but um, I think we may end up filling up all of our spaces with uh, people learning how to apply for government grants in drone technology, space technology, cyber technology. And we, there's, the building was architected with a lot of classroom space. So we have plenty of space for uh, conducting training and education. The Michigan Historical Preservation Network doesn't currently have a location to do training. So along with the magnificent architectural uh, features of Broadhead Armory, we would actually have the Michigan Historical Preservation Network doing training in the facility. And now they can walk downstairs and walk around the building and see 
perfect examples of what they just studied in uh, the classroom training. Uh, we have included um, STEM training for uh, youths uh, working with the Go Lightly High School and the Civ Michigan Civil Air Patrol out at the uh, Detroit Airport. Um, we would have a lot, a lot of components of STEM training in there, an extension of the Starbase out at Selfridge, which has a model of the space shuttle up there. I mean, space, space technology is it's in our future. And so we want to prepare our younger people for those future enterprises. And then finally, the, the third floor was a dining room. It's always been a dining room. That's where some of the murals are. When uh, David Friedenhall, he studied with Diego Rivera, who painted over the DIA. He worked, uh, came from Cranbrook Academy. Um, he, a lot of those murals are on that third floor. We're right now looking at a, a first class dining and a casual dining. Uh, so if you wanted to go and take your um, significant other for a, a very nice event, you could go there. And me being a big jazz guy, I love jazz, I love blues, I love Motown. Um, I'm hoping that we can get uh, that relationship with Gretchen Ballad, Chris Collins at the Detroit Jazz Festival community uh, for that second floor and have some nice background music going on while you're dining. Or you could go up to the fourth floor where uh, we're looking at right now having a, a beer garden, an outdoor beer garden. Mm. From that veranda, you could actually see the APBA Gold Cup hydroplane race or you could watch the Detroit fireworks, or you could watch the Detroit Grand Prix, literally from that roof. And that residential tower uh, that we're envisioning uh, would not interfere with those views. So you'll be elevated above um, you know, a, a line of sight where it will give you a very strategic advantage to see those venues real time. And that's, uh, Working with the event planners, we are, we are envisioning having events literally every single weekend with tents in the parking lot, uh, activities that would cater to the local community, but also be a magnet for people in the suburbs to come down or, or some of the other communities to come down to Detroit and, and bring the place back to life. That's really what we want to do. We want to bring it back to life. Absolutely. I yeah. think your plan is outstanding. I want you if to I let might people add to know. That, I'm sorry, say it again. If I might add to that. Yes, you may. Go ahead. We've been talking predominantly about phase one, which is the broad head armor itself. As a strategic move to preempt any uh, opposition, I came up with an idea to add a 15 to 22 story um, tower for commercial uh, office space, retail and condominiums, as well as um, uh, affordable housing for our veterans. So uh, I thought it was a good strategy and I think it is a good strategy. In addition to uh, having that, uh, we're also going to have um, uh, a seawall and a ship uh, or a pier that would accommodate uh, uh, visiting ships. So it would really make it a world-class uh, tourism attraction, actually. Yeah, Valerie, we already have the boats, okay? So we have some former Navy boats that we, our intention would be to bring those down to Detroit, similar to Broadhead has traditionally had boats, Navy boats, a Navy submarine, a minesweeper, and people come down there and they tour. Kids would go on those boats and train how to work in the merchant marine industry. And that would be uh, integrated into our STEM and education and training curriculum as to how 
uh, kids or even adults can get qualified in different maritime uh, functions and features uh, with those boats right there on the riverfront. And then you could come and take a tour of them or they could be the focus of uh, some major events as they have done in Muskegon, Michigan with the LSD. Uh, they actually have a, a boat there in Muskegon and, and it operates, it's very busy in the summer. Um, with Robert, the, Robert's idea about the tower was fitting since, as we all recognize, especially like last year, you can't gather, okay? So people are working remotely, you can't have events. So the, the tower actually supplements our working capital fund and provides um, a little bit of a cushion during periods of economic uh, challenges. So, um, you know, obviously we couldn't have any large scale Navy balls, Marine Corps balls or weddings at Broadhead right now. Uh, with COVID, but the towers would provide a steady source of income uh, to allow us to keep the doors open uh, with a reduced uh, crowd. You know, if we could only do 25%, well, we can still accommodate them with 25% people, still be in the black financially. So, and you have the money for this project, you have financial backing, correct? We have, we have more than what we need, okay? So, like I said, I'm 100% confident we're just not smoke and mirrors. We are the real thing. We can really make this happen. How can people find more information about your project? Do you have a Facebook page or a website or something? And how can they support you? Do you have a petition going or something of that nature where people can support this effort so we can come together collectively to let the city of Detroit know that the veteran community wants the Broadhead Armory preserved and we do so not the, want it for so the Kuwait company? The, I suggest the easy thing. When you go to Google or Microsoft Edge or whatever web browser you use, just type in Broadhead, B-R-O-D-H-E-A-D. -E now don't get confused because there's a city in Wisconsin called Broadhead. <laughs> so you might have to, you know, look around a little bit. Our, our uh, website is actually called Broadhead Groups. Uh, since we represent uh, three entities, we have the Broadhead Armory Preservation Society, we call it BAPS. And that's really, I mean, they are historical people. I mean, they are the, the creme de creme of people in the historical business. They, they won't let us get away with any compromise or any shortcuts on doing this right. And then we have the Broadhead Association, which is somewhat of the umbrella group. And then we have uh, RTB Development LLC, which is the development group, which would sunset once we finish the development uh, piece of it. And we might envision um, other organizations, again, with the small business development activity on the second deck, we expect to generate multiple businesses, new businesses, private enterprises by people like you and people in the Metro Detroit area, we expect that they will start their own business and we will generate multiple new businesses every month for those uh, new startups. Um, so we will obviously morph into a much larger enterprise uh, in the future. Thank you so much gentlemen our time is coming to an end commander is there anything you would like to say as closing remarks to our viewers and to our listeners if so please do so at this time so my my final comment together everybody accomplishes more that's called team 
and we hope that everybody in the fifth district will reach out to their uh, city council member, Mary Sheffield, or Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, or Deborah Dingle, or Scott Benson, and let them know how much you care about Broadhead and the Broadhead Association's future for the community. Over to you, Robert. Yes, also we have a petition drive, as you had mentioned, Valerie, uh, earlier on our website. We also have a donation link on our new website um, that would allow uh, potential donors to uh, come in and make contributions to our project. Um, by the way, our capital stack is derived from a combination of sponsorship equity, um, equity investors, limited partnerships, uh, mezzanine financing, as well as junior and senior debt. One thing about the Detroit skyline is we need, if you look at other major cities, Chicago, wh wherever you are, Minnesota, their skyline along their river front is just off the charts in terms of the the cityscape mm -hmm. and and with high rises and so forth and here we have um we've got the biggest high rises general motors mm -hmm. on the detroit riverfront but we need to build up our skyline as well as other major cities have along their riverfront and water and the waterfront and that's why we have proposed um the 15 to 22 story um, residential tower, commercial and office uh, space there. And um, I guess in closing, um, we are certainly uh, grateful to have this opportunity for you uh, presenting uh, us with the ability to talk about our project. And uh, we thank you so much for allowing us to inform the public as to what our plans are and aspirations are for the Broadhead property and, um, and to take an interest in what we're doing and support our cause. Thank well, you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you both. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about this historic monument on East Jefferson, just past Belle Isle, that I've driven by plenty of times, did not know the historical aspects, did not know the black history. And if those walls could talk, I'm sure there is so much more. But last but not least, I want to thank you for your service and the sacrifice that you made, Sergeant Middleton and Commander Semerad, for this country. And you're still on the battlefield with the Broadhead Preservation Association with this project. I want to thank you so much because I agree, divided we beg, united we bargain. So let's come together <laughs> and support the Broadhead Association with the redevelopment and historic preservation of this. And if I want to add a little something on the end, it would be nice to bring in one of your historic battleships and turn it into a restaurant. I like to eat and have some wine. <laughs> that would be really nice wow. <laughs> to Jeez. have one of those historic vessels to come there and be parked and turn it into a restaurant. And you can listen to live music and stuff on the inside, have a nice glass of wine and listen to some jazz. That would be amazing. Absolutely. All righty. Well, we're out of here. We're going to close the show. Thank you, gentlemen. And I'm glad to be here for you. If you need anything from me, the door is always open. You're welcome to come here anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerie. All righty. Salute. You have been listening to Black Coffee, No Sugar, No Cream, where I don't try to spill any tea or make you feel dazed like you had a shot of cheap liquor. I just want to give you another perspective and another way to look at things. And tonight it was through the lens of the Broadhead Associ Preservation Association. And we want to save that historical monument that's just of east of Belle Isle. And we want to turn it into the dream of these two men who have served this country. 
we're going to get out of here. And as always, stay safe and stay healthy. So long.